Hi, this is Brad Doug saying hi. Uh, first of my videos I'm going to do is going to be a discussion. And um, it's to talk about what does, uh, from my perspective, what are things going to look like in the future for IT? Um, but not just for the business of IT, but also for the users that use all the varieties of computer systems and so on ranging from basic internet access to all the way up to high power gaming. And um, over time, because I come from the world of retiring mainframe systems, working with these new founded systems called x86 based uh, machines. And these machines evolved from standard workstations into servers, into megaplex servers, into clusters and all this other cool stuff. And then now that itself is evolving into multiple families of processor style systems such as ARMS and of course AMD platforms, Cyrix, which is a an older platform that was once around and is no longer, and but many other formed standards and um, technologies that have evolved the nature of what we call you know computer hardware, computer usage. And what could we do if we thought outside the box for the future? Well, the best way to approach that is to look at history. And I've gone through three cycles, life cycles of our industry. And from the mainframes into the x86 introductions and into the advanced tiered structures of technologies that would take x86 to a whole new level. And of course, the key thing about x86 strategy is it, it was the foreground work for risk processing, uh, which is re reducing instruction sets, uh, processing um, AMD, uh, as well as ARMS processors and other resources. So the most important thing about the, these standards is they produce this thing we call the PC tower, the personal computer tower. That's what PC tower means. Uh, some of them are small form factor, tiny, little skinny things, um, and others are big. And we'll talk about the big towers in the future as well. But in today's world, versus what it was 8 to 10 years ago, everything was being, how do we make the standard more, 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 more? And so we had our DIMMs, and you know, once we had, we had DIPs for memory, then we have SIMs, and then we had DIMMs. And um, the evolutionary effect of like, for instance, Soho DIMMs, which is the same capacity as DIMM, but it's half the size. So it works in the laptops. But with that being said, there was a trend that was beginning. So what ended up happening is at that time, you know, this was the norm and this was starting to take over that norm. The 2.5 inch smaller, but it does the same. It spins a little faster, it's a little quicker, a little functional, more functional. And you can put a lot more of these in than you could, uh, of course, with the traditional so on. But this goes across the board with everything. Some devices altogether almost completely vanish, such as CD-ROM drives. You know, we could condense them down a little bit, but uh, eventually we replace the CD-ROM drives with... USB memory sticks, or in this case, a hard drive, an NVMe hard drive. But even when we started to learn portability and compatibility, and as well, compatibility is important because back in the day, you know, mobile hard drives were only compatible with Windows or they were only compatible with Apple. But the industry, the open industry, not referring to Microsoft, not referring to Apple, but the open industry kept it real, kept it true and made things compatible. Very important detail. Why? Because it's now leading to the next level that I think will be coming down the road. What will that be? Well, traditional motherboards are so big and they have lots of space on them. They have a big processor. They have a cooling pro stack on them. They've got a place for you know, video cards. They have a place for all the connections and everything you need. The idea is sound, how it works. Then, Again, you know, we have the same mindset. Can we get it smaller? And the answer to that question is, yes, we can. So this is a Raspberry Pi as an example, but there are many other versions that are almost about the same size. And if we look at how the trend is working right now, and we're going from 
this big hard drive, a two and a three and a half inch, which does still have value, by the way, in the future, to the two and a half standard, which is still spinning, not so much of a future, to the SSD non-spinning, non-mechanical hard drive that uses RAM in a different way called 3D NAN uh, um, hard drive capacity memory, which is not the same as random access memory you have on your motherboard. This holds data just like a traditional spinning hard drive. But that wasn't good enough. Yeah, that's right. It wasn't good enough. So what'd they do? Made it smaller. NVMe, and this is the big version. There's another version that's half the, the, the length of it. So we've got the makings of a new industry. And, you know, when you look at the Raspberry Pis, you thought that NVMe was small? Guess again. So the reality of the fact is we can, within a very small footprint as this big, provide an i7. That's a decent, really good processor for, I would say, 75% of most personal computer usage and is a very good starter core for those people who want to learn how to do initial clustering and things like that to go forward and use that as a standard. So imagine you have a, a logic board slightly larger than this. It'll have a heat sink on the top, obviously, to keep the the um, CPU and the built-in GPU on the CPU cool. And But there's 32 gigs or 64 gigs or 128 gigs of memory on this. And on the back is that NVMe memory, you know, for your hard drive. Pretty small. Don't get fixed on the car, on the system. Think about the concept. So if you look closely, you'll see these little pins here. Well, that's technically a bus. It allows data communication. It allows voltage transfer and so on and so on. You can do a lot of things with these pins, but if you were to contort the pin into what's called a communication bus, then you could literally stack two of these on top of each other and create a multi-core simple server in the footprint of the thickness of two of these cases. That's unprecedented. Now, granted, you would only do that to like host a web service or to have a specific task like a, a function in that building or it's a security system or something like that. But because you have a bus and if it's like most common buses, it will have two data pathways. That means that guy can actually have a failover bus and that can allow you to take the NVMe memory on this side and the NVMe hard disk memory on the second card, pair them up and create one uh, RAID 1 pairings of disk capacity and make this a failover cluster. See what I mean? The flexibility is pretty awesome. Again, don't get fixed on the card. Get fixed on the idea. Now, how what, how, what would this look like? What happens to the PC tower? I'll get to that in a minute. You can always remember that personal computer is the equivalency of a display screen, a keyboard, and a mouse, or a trackball, or a thumb pin, thumb pin, or something like that, or even a stylus. Some people use a variety of different things to do what they need to do. And in that process, they have the ability of being able to handle and work with a computer. But, but in the future, what if the keyboard is the, is the computer? Actually, the keyboard isn't the actual computer. It's just got a slot on the bottom of it to allow you to plug in an I.O. card like this, slide in the back, have the power output, plug it in the wall, plug a small adapter key in it, and there's your computer. And, okay, how could we do this even smarter? Well, in the old days, we had something called the all-in-one computer. What was the all-in-one computer? It was a monitor. That's right. And it would have a small daughter card set or a small thin or a wise terminal or some type of thin PC on the back, and that PC would just directly connect to it. Or in some cases, like HP all-in-ones and Asus all-in-ones, they put the logic inside the case housing of the monitor case itself. And that seems to be a pretty good solution, too. So when you buy a monitor, it will no longer, in the future, be a monitor. That's the important thing. The other thing is, it will not be a, a personal computer, per se. 
it will be the monitor is the is the process that does all of your requests and that can uh, that can lead us away from the traditional sense of an operating system and it could be more of a browser mode not a browser mode as in the internet browser that would be an added component but a browser mode of the functionalities of the monitor which can allow you to put usb devices like keyboards and so on on board though i do see and suspect wireless mode transmissions would be able to accomplish that too. So there would be no cable connection, just a single power cable and batteries in your IO input devices like mice and keyboards. And uh, there's no actual hookup. It's just the monitors there on the wall and you get it. Now you ask the question, what, what about pairing? Can't I, uh, I like the idea of taking two of these boards and stacking them on top of each other and pair them up. Yes and no it would be a different kind of pairing. You can take two monitors, because a lot of us have two or even more monitors, and you can pair them side by side. And with that, you could have what's called a bridge over cable, which is antiquated. It's old school. It's kind of like Beowulf kind of thoughts. Wouldn't do it. What I would do or consider is a multi-wireless -wire node encrypted link. In other words, let's say it's eight or four transmitter heads and receiver heads that are sitting there and they communicate in an encrypted pairing state. And they constantly do that. And all they do is look for A channel and B channel, A monitor and the monitor number B or letter B. And A and B connect, they synchronize, and now you can start doing what you want to do. You can't take them too far apart because the signals are fairly high frequency, fairly close, and signal intensity is important to maintain uh, signal co co cohesiveness. But if you're looking at a desktop, you know, the desktop and how big a normal traditional desk is, you know, it's basically two and a half feet wide, around three or four feet long, maybe even bigger. Uh, that space is easily enough space to allow these two compute monitors to be side by side. And they still do everything you want you to do. Browse, internet, data, you name it, everything you need. Um, and you can use an internet connect connector browser state to run like Google Docs for documents and things like that for documentation or writing up spreadsheets or stuff like that. But that's not it. That's not the only thing. You can have a keyboard, like I said earlier, that is slightly larger, very similar to what we call the old IBM PS2 keyboards. They can handle up to four of these guys inside, and that would be considered a power user station. And all four of those guys just look like a single machine to you. And But they've got four stacks of cores, they've got a pile of RAM, and a pile of storage, and it's all in the size of a traditional style keyboard, which is kind of saying something, because uh, the full-size keyboards actually are pretty nice, and they're coming back. But with that being said, the next thing is, okay, now you hit the, the point of, what about big towers? They are not going away. They're going to be more expensive because they are more than just simply a CPU with capacity. What do I mean? Well, three major evolutionary things have happened in the past six years. One, crypto mine mindset. In other words, encryption, crypto mining, other variances of that are in the equation, which broke the mold of traditional devices. Yes, hard drives can crypto mine. See what I mean? I had nothing to do with the CPU and other devices such as the GPU, the CPU, and other components and functionalities making availability, i.e. your network connectivity. If you've got lots of disks like you see back here, uh, you can do some significant style uh, storage encryption, or sorry, storage crypto you know, mining, and you can do even more. The key thing is the PowerPC traditional tower and its capacity to do what it does will never truly go away because it holds the key to the process. And that process is important because that is, again, thinking outside the box, that the PC tower will always be the winner on that front because it has room, right? It can do a lot. It can handle a lot of PCI bus connections. 
And I'll tell you, some of the kids out here in the industry today are just sharp as whips, and they're awesome, and I'm really impressed with many of them. They're just taking the, this gear and they're transforming them into pseudo tier enterprise style footprints, but they did it in a, in a small area with a little bit of firepower, i.e. a few of, you know, a few small microboards, and they are producing some really interesting, neat concepts. And again, we're redefining the nature of what the industry will look like. Warning, Microsoft, i.e. Microsoft Surface, is geared as an appliance device. An appliance device, as to explain that to you, what does it mean? Is a device that's specifically made, designed to be very difficult to repair, very difficult to enhance, very difficult to upgrade, if not impossible. It has a finite, defined value of, of a role. It will only do so much. And it's, in my opinion, it's just strictly my personal opinion, but I have not seen this anywhere effectively well done. It's designed to, to fail. It's planned obsolescence in its worst way. I absolutely despise plan, uh, uh, planned obsolescence. I know all the engineers and the salespeople out there in the industry and all of that, they all say, well, how else are we going to keep our jobs? Simple. Keep innovating. It's an easy answer. When you're sitting on your laurels and trying to make everybody follow an antiquated standard and format, and you wonder why the Apple phone is so difficult to sell, it's because it's so far behind the technologies because it's an appliance. That's right. You just design it specifically for isolated tasks. And you know that the tasks will eventually get slower and slower and slower. And this promotes you to push the customer to buy another appliance. It's the same mindset as with washer and dryer and so on and so on. But thank the Lord, there are people out there, there are industries out there who don't subscribe to that. They make quality equipment. And that quality equipment is so sufficient, it absolutely drives the Apples and the Microsofts of the world nuts because they don't see what they expect in their pocket as profit because of that approach. They stifle innovation by trying to heavily format it into a single our way only or the highway and just don't, you know, just don't do it at all because you're not capable of it. And I, I think that's demeaning. I think that is treating us as the users as idiots. You know, they really do. You know, you can even see it in some of the, the functional commercials that kind of do narratives that have nothing to do with the product. But the whole point of it is let's entertain you so you don't realize what we're really doing. And that's the truth. The truth of the matter is, if you make a good product, you'll be working with it for 5, 10, 15 years, along with buying other things. We're buying. We're just not buying through your ability to try to control us what we buy. And that's the key detail. I went out to eBay and I got all of this stuff out here because people were forced to buy the next thing called uh, what's called product life cycling. In our industry, in the operations industries, you do have to make sure that you have warranty coverage on your equipment. And when that becomes too expensive or it's not even available anymore, you have to, in this case, put it up on sale for eBay or something like that and buy new hardware. That's a requirement. That's not planned obsolescence because many of us people run out there real quick and buy this stuff. We don't need a warranty. We know how to fix it. We know how to turn it into something else. And that's the cool part about that process. And I think that's actually starting to reverse in the industry as well. They're starting to realize, you know, we don't actually have to have all of our hardware, you know, sent out the door. We can develop a plan for product development and use non-warranty hardware, but build up the high availability. So if it fails, no big deal. We're still operational. We can still do everything we want. And that's where we're heading. And again, those industries that don't want us to do that, and they want us and they need us to buy their stuff periodically. Uh, well, unfortunately, that ends up haunting you. So that's why when I say Microsoft and Apple and devices like these, um, they're almost impossible to work with. Uh, and that was the goal. That was the mission. That was the objective. Um, all you have to do is try to upgrade it. You know, try to upgrade one of these devices. You can't. You know, if you even so much as crack these things open, warranty voided instantly. You know, it's even geared 
so that they are able to determine that you opened it and they are, they are right there to immediately get rid of your warranty because they get the money they want. Now, will you ever buy another product from them ever again? Well, that's not my call. That's your call. So, but anyways, the point is, I think in the future, computers will fit in very small footprints that will be out there and will give you the ability to take that tiny little footprint and just slip it into a keyboard, uh, slip it into a compatibility module, which is what I do think the industry will be. I think monitors, I think appliance interfaces, even security systems, even large scale TVs or a, a new industry keyboards, they'll have a slot in them that's empty. But when you slide your small micro board into it and it's 100% compatible, uh, and it could be AMD, it could be Intel, it could be any standard processor. But when it slides into the into your, your I.O. bus, in this case, the I.O. bus being uh, the input-output of a keyboard and a mouse that are on a wireless configuration with your device, and then using wireless transmission to a monitor screen so it can bring up a computer display screen, um, it will be probably how we see things in the future. And I think, again... The micro buses are going to get smaller and smaller where we can actually get it into about a third of the size of this. And um, with that, making it literally a card slot, put it. And you could literally just pull it out like a USB stick. That's your computer. It's a little larger than a USB stick, but it's got all the juice that you need and everything you want. And it just has to go into your whatever interface you want it to have. May it be... Um, for, like I said, slipped into the back of a big 28, you know, I'm sorry, an 85 inch display screen. And that becomes its new home or in a keyboard set. And it doesn't have to be what I've suggested. It can be anything. The important thing is that compatibility, that open industry mindset, it's got a force of its own and everybody has to respect it because it's where all the innovation comes from and all of the reinventation where things are reinvented. And turned into something even better. There will be more to come on this. But I thought this was a really good thing. Because the more I look around. The more I see we're heading in that direction. So this is a, a future projection. In this particular case. I'm taking the time to project. What we think will be. You know. At least in my head. what How I see things evolving. But the next discussion we'll have is. How does networking Stop being networking and become a universal stack communication bus. That's a really cool one. I'll cover that one next. It's complicated, but it's neat because it explains how you could technically allow most forms of communication to be handled on different spectrums of frequencies within a small area and eliminate all forms of cabling. May it be USB, may it be PS2. May it be network cables, fiber optic cables, whatever. The point is, there is a way in the future, and I think it's coming sooner than we think, um, that can prioritize the nature of network communication levels where one or two switches, which do still have port inputs on them, but a limited number, but have a series of what's called generational tra uh, transceivers. Generational transceivers means each generation of communication bus is specifically targeted for a specific frequency for a type of communication. And then all you have to do is pair it. And just like you do Bluetooth, but it would be the interface process. But we'll cover that in the next video. It's another future innovation concept that's out there, something that could be um, thought out of. Again, it's all about getting outside the box and looking back in. This is Brad Dyke. God bless and have a great weekend.